All right, we're at uh, top of the hour here, so we will get started. Thank you all for joining today. Uh, we're very excited for today's presentation on the Smart Warehouse, so let's get started here. Please note that we have all attendees on mute, but if questions come up throughout the presentation, please enter them in the chat box and we will address them during our Q&A at the end of our session here. Next slide, please. So we're gonna start today with a quick agenda here. We will do brief introductions to our speakers and topics for the day. We are excited here to be learning about the foundations of a smart warehouse from Jeff Lem and to think about achieving growth through the warehouse maturity model with Mark Wheeler. We will then take some uh, questions and answers at the end of our session here. Next slide. So my name is Will Barnett. I am with Barcodes Inc. and I'm our director of ISV Business Development. Primarily my focus is on aligning with, uh, aligning with the right partners in our industry. And uh, today we've got two of our great partners on here. Uh, Jeff Lem, the president of Portable Intelligence, uh, as well as Mark Wheeler, the Supply Chains Director uh, with Zebra Technologies. So a little bit of background on our companies here. Uh, Barcodes Inc. has been in business for a little over 25 years now. Uh, we are well over 600 employees globally. We are known as a leader now in the uh, mobile device, uh, mobile printers, stationary printers, RFID. When you think about anything from rugged or field worker mobility, we are kind of the hardware experts in this space. We support over 70% of the Fortune 500 companies. We do have over 150,000 customers worldwide, and we do have full global presence now in the US, um, the UK, multiple locations in Canada and Latin America. Next slide. A little bit of background on Zebra. Many of you may be familiar with Zebra. They are certainly an industry leader. Uh, they have a very deep experience in this industry over 50 years now. Uh, they have an unmatched breadth of products and services. Certainly more our investment in R&D than any of their competitors. They are a market leader uh, in multiple categories. They, are, they have a very extensive partner ecosystem, um, obviously meeting with us here today. And then multiple innovation and workplace awards. There's no question that Zebra is a leader in the space. Perfect. And Portable Intelligence, um, they are a leader in smart warehouse management software solutions. I'm really excited to talk to Jeff today about some of his experience and expertise in this space. Um, they're designed for manufacturers and distributors looking to optimize their warehouse processes without the addition of labor or space. And Jeff has also been gracious enough. Yeah, he is an author and he's gonna uh, actually raffle off three of his books for attendees on this call that will happen after this call. So please do look for an email following this call for the winners of uh, those books. Next slide. So now we're gonna start with learning about the smart warehouse from Jeff Lem. Jeff, take it away. Great, thanks, Will, and uh, really appreciate uh, being on this webinar today. Uh, quick background, I've been extensively involved in warehouse uh, management systems for over 20 years. I've lost, frankly, count of how many WMS implementations I've been involved in. It's at least 150. I, chose, I used that experience in both for deploying WMS solutions in both manufacturing and distributing to write this book, which is now into its second edition. And so I'm gonna be happy to give away uh, several copies of the book at the, at the end of the webinar. I'm also, by the way, the Director of Education for the Material Handling Society of Ontario. And I have a professional designation in material handling um, from that same association. So first, talk a bit about some warehouse trends. I'm not, yeah, great, thank you. Uh, and this is kind of a short, certainly it's a little biased, you know, it came, uh, a study was done uh, by the Conger Group and they identified digitization of, of the warehouse from both a warehouse management system and a warehouse execution system as the top trend, followed by robots, AGVs, AMRs, uh, AS, RS systems and wearables of which uh, included uh, one of Zebra's latest new offerings, the WS50. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm going to focus on number one, which is the warehouse management side of things. And this is going to be really your foundation. You may already have a WMS or you may be looking at one. And I'm going to talk today about how do you build a great warehouse with your WMS. And it's going to start with the part one, which is the pure basics. And then part two, which is going to be a deeper dive into the types of processes uh, that we sh you should look to automate. 
first talking about the warehouse itself. Uh, this is what happens to a typical part. Uh, you know, you've got one part coming in, in this case, to a manufacturing facility. It's handled by as many as up to five different people, um, nine different departments that pass through, and all the little red circles there are things that can happen to the part itself, such as being put in the wrong location, being incorrectly labeled, or somebody just forgetting where they put it. So little doubt that a lot of things can go sideways in a warehouse, and that's why managing and tracking this inventory is of the utmost importance, but again, a lot of things can go sideways. So the job of, of ourselves here is to help you create the smart warehouse that is both agile and it gives you accurate inventory at all level. So we're going to start with the basics around that. And what does that look like? And you know, I'm gonna start with an example of what a typical manufacturer looks like. This is actually a slide uh, from one of our customers. And you can see on the left, this is their sales history over the last five years going back from 2019. And you can see on the right that graph, which is basically their inventory and hand levels, which almost mirrors um, their growth in sales. So as their sales grew or declined, so did their inventory levels, pretty much in lockstep. And everybody thinks that's normal. In reality, this is what's actually happening to them. They're, when you put the two numbers together, the sales to inventory ratio actually starts to decrease. So back in 2016, when they had a, a peak, they drove $29 a sale for every dollar of inventory. Fast forward to 2019, when their uh, sales actually were actually decreasing, their inventory levels were actually staying the same. So as a result, their sales per dollar of inventory actually dropped to $23, which meant they were actually losing control of their inventory and having too much excess stock. What you wanna to try to achieve with the smart warehouse is to be able to flatten the inventory curve. So I'm gonna go through a couple of examples of our customers and their history of using our product. And this could be, this, this should be the same result irrespective of the WMS. So we got the first example, a health food distributor who went live with our system in 2015. And you see their sales increasing slightly over that time by 15%. They were actually able to increase or decrease their inventory levels by 17%. So had their inventories increased at the same level of their sales, they would have spent an actually $6 million more in inventory over that time. Likewise, for an HVAC manufacturer, his sales increased about 19% over a five-year period or four-year period, I should say, and the inventories only increased 5.4%, again, another sales of about $1.6 million. A couple of other examples, you've got a, a furniture manufacturer, Large dramatic sales and uh, increase in sales. The, these folks sold to Costco and they made uh, things like Murphy beds, which were very popular. And as a result of that, their inventory has only increased 14%. Again, another huge savings in inventory. And there's an electronics distributor um, selling to big box retailers like Best Buy. Their sales increased 21%. They're actually able to decrease their inventory by almost 3%. Again, another $1.2 million in savings over that period. This actually resulted in a, their procurement or their supply chain director being promoted to president when they saw those numbers and, and profitability. So let's get into the smart warehouse. How did we start achieving the smart warehouse? Firstly, it starts with these four items in the orange here. So we work on the outside and then work our way in. A lot of our deployments start this way. And certainly they're a bit of a mixture because a lot of customers say, well, our biggest problem is picking and shipping. So we'll do these uh, outer elements and then include a picking and shipping, say in phase one. And here's one of our customers showing off to me, you know, how he's uh, recently put in uh, rack labeling and start labeling all the products. Um, they're a great success story in that they're actually able to increase their inventory turns dramatically such that they're actually also able to reduce their inventories. So first step, we're going to look at facility prep. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it means setting up warehouses. It means setting up enough granularity in your bins and your locations. It means taking a look at your ERP and WMS and, the, and, and figure out, do I need to configure and upgrade it? A lot of times when we go into a situation, we found out that, the, uh, that certain data points are missing because 
certain features in the ERP hasn't been turned on. For example, it's not uncommon for me to go into a warehouse uh, situation or into a facility, found that they have one location called Maine, and that's where all of their inventory is stored. So that clearly won't uh, assist in improving inventory accuracy, which is done at both a location and uh, quantity basis. Setting up a Wi-Fi network and our friends at Barcodes can certainly help you with that. Uh, figuring out parts and materials identification. A lot of companies need to have barcode ready part numbers. A typical good barcode that is, or I should say a part number that is good for barcoding is between five to seven, uh, seven digits. Anything bigger than that, you're gonna get rather large barcodes. As well as identify your equipment needs and do what we call a business review, which consists of identifying the areas in which you wanna bar, uh, do, do, do the automation. And here's an example of a customer um, who used a lot of whiteboards uh, throughout the facility to identify where orders that are missing parts, to identify uh, things that need to be done or in terms of communication. Again, it's not real time. It's, this is only updated every couple of hours. Fast forward, he's now got um, KPIs and dashboards in terms of um, real time. And that's the, the, the advantage of having a WS solution that provides that. So things you need to focus on when you do locations is, I, I use an acronym called ZABO, Zone Isle Bay Level BIN, which means how you set up your locations, set up hold areas, to decide how you want you to do your pick path direction. Is it gonna be serpentine? It's gonna be up and down the aisle, uh, whatever direction that would influence how you, how you label your locations. Also understand the difference in, in purchasing versus stocking and selling units of measurement. You know, you may buy in cases, but you may sell in eaches. So you gotta understand how that is set up and then set up your barcodes appropriately to support those units of measuring. Labeling, big deal on that. I'll get into that later on. And then the key data points, making sure they have their appropriate uh, data points like POs, SOs, workers, IBTs, which stands for interbranch transfers, part IDs. They have to be in, in place in order to support proper data collection. And then deciding what kind of symbology you want, 1D versus 2D, et cetera. And least but not, uh, certainly it, uh, totally recommending now is to purchase your hardware early. It's you know you got two to three months lead time I'm seeing, so do it earlier. The next thing is support transfers recording, recording from and to. Um, here's an example of companies who are using a manual card record. And this is a fundamental, what you need to track, whether it's stock to production, whip tracking of work and process goods, finished goods to stock, and then basically a complete process of tracking from stock to shipping. And the best way to do this is to have obviously a WMS solution that supports real-time data collection. You will print transfer labels to track the movements of these products. You want to eliminate where you can paper records and also be careful about auto recording. A lot of BRPs and WMSs actually will auto, auto um, place certain items unbeknownst to you. So if a person actually is, is doing a put away and the put away is to a primary location and for whatever reason that primary location isn't available, the, the actual worker may put it into another location, make sure that he records that ideally via scanning. And this screen here, the inventory lookup screen is often the best friend of the warehouse worker. This alone saves uh, several miles of walk in a day. A lot of the guys uh, say in the warehouse that having this screen, this quick lookup capability gives them the ability to quickly find products wherever they, they are without having to actually walk down an aisle. Another thing we also encourage as well is to use the labels that come from the suppliers. We'll talk a bit about more of that, that later on. Next thing is psycho counts. Is, you know, a lot of people do psycho counts. You can do ABC categorizations, locate by count by location, by part, by velocity. Make sure you have dedicated personnel and you have a set schedule. And here's a gentleman at one of our customer facilities doing a psycho count as we speak. The key things to do there as well is you want real time data capture, you want obviously paperless. You also want to focus on both quantity and location accuracy. So this is where you need to have some granularity in your locations, set up uh, scanning at the bin location, and use this feature called part alias, which is the ability to scan a supplier's part number and have it automatically converted to your internal part number. And a lot of WMSs and ERPs should support that as a matter of turning on that feature and then setting up the part alias for it in those systems. 
and then making sure that you understand the stock and unit of measurement. For example, case of scanning versus each of scanning, and then provide training. We've had horror stories where we've had clients who would go and hire temporary staff, put a scanner in hand, and they say, go start scanning. And instead of scanning the UPC label, they actually start scanning a case label, or they start scanning some other barcode like the, like the lot number, and you end up with rather large quantities. So needless to say, always hire, if you're going to outsource this, hire a firm that specializes in this kind of work. And this is for the manufacturers in our audience today. Um, if you're doing any sort of rework, co-products, meaning that as you run a production process, you got um, additional products being produced, like a, a right-handed side door handle. If you run a, a job, you, you the mold may, may produce both left and right-hand versions of it. And then scrap. So it comes up many names. Um, I, I've seen it called buttons, awful, rework, co-products, or basically unused products. And there's a picture of some unused products sitting on the production floor. It's been issued to a job, but it hasn't been returned. And when I ask them how often they get around to putting these back, they say when they have time to do it, which isn't very often. So they end up having this secondary inventory, unrecorded, that's sitting on the floor that could be available for another job, which then causes purchasing to go and buy more stuff because they're not aware that this is unused product or available. So the ways around that is to have somebody go around, put it away, use the adjust in function. And I just would, would um, warn you that when you use the adjust-in function on most systems, it adjusts the inventory in at standard cost. So you need to make sure your standard cost is accurate. A better way of doing that is that if you do have scrap that is valuable, that say has copper or steel in it, and you want to track it properly, is to receive scrap as a co-product on your work order. So now you've got a work order receiving proper finished goods, then you got a co-product, which will be the scrap that you can track and then apply a label to it, such as this. And then, of course, you can always do issue returns against the work order, which means would deduct any uh, materials as you to work order, and then finally return to stock. And that's the basics. So if you can do those four basics well, you've now set your, your warehouse up for additional work processes. Now, um, and these, these four are inbound production, picking, shipping, and labeling. Now, we do have a lot of customers that say to us, I, I'll do the basics, or can I just do two of the basics and do one of these, because this is where the ROI is. Absolutely. But we do recommend that you do the basics first, because that sets the foundation for these uh, processes and also sets the foundation for future automation, be it robots, AMRs, et cetera. So let's get into inbound. So an inbound consists of both receiving and put away. What are you receiving? Incoming goods. You're also getting a lot of vendor data. You're getting, you're getting supplier labels um, being applied there. You may have inspections and QC required on these parts. A lot of it's done informally, but there is a way to set up a formal inspection that automatically puts the product on hold. And it's, and it's just a matter of your dummy us recognizing that. Got to be also accept a number of different data points like POs, quantities, lot numbers, version numbers, etc. If you're an automotive manufacturer, you get a lot of um, vendor codes as well as well as vendor versions. And then you also may want to capture what we call OSDs, overages, shorts, and damage as well. And then you may have to also receive fun ASNs, which is always a challenge to receive. How do you do it? First of all, you set up your system receive POs and things like RMAs. You set up hold locations in your warehouse to automatically put goods under inspection into those hold locations. You're set up the ability to scan supplier labels with the part ALS function. And you also can do a picture capture. A lot of times product comes in damaged or short. So what you want to do is capture a picture on your device and immediately send it to your vendor for the proper credit and record. You also want on-demand labeling. Uh, nothing is more confusing and challenging to the people in receiving when they're given a stack of labels and then they got to sort through it to figure out which, when it, which ones it is. This way you have on-demand label comes out as required. And then the last thing you need to do is make sure you scan to put away location. Just give an example of these vendor labels. And here's a label that came in for a battery. And what the client was doing before that was attaching these post-it notes, writing internally their own part number. Whereas in reality, all they had to do is to scan this particular part and no more relabeling. 
The next thing is production. Again, for your for the manufacturers out there, things you want to track on the production side of things is issuing of raw materials, transfers to production. So you're now moving from a, a warehouse to the production floor areas. You also want to record transfers between warehouses, which is also creates the biggest source of confusion because you don't know what's in warehouse B and what's warehouse or else A. Recording your consumption um, as it happens. And then work order received, which is your finished goods receipt. So as you do that, you should be labeling your raw materials and finished goods. As you pull it from stock to take the production area, you can create a, a raw materials label properly identifying it. Also encourage you to consider creating a marketplace. And what a marketplace is, it is consists of a series of kits that are pre-built to support production. Here's one of our customers that has all these kits that they compile together. They're really just the totes with the appropriate label, identifying the work order is gonna be pulled in. So as they transfer the materials from the warehouse to this marketplace, it actually takes that out of inventory, moves it to the marketplace, but in the marketplace is no longer considered inventory as opposed to a lot of systems will still treat it as inventory and give you a false reading as to how much you really have on hand, right? And also last thing is what a lot of manufacturers do is they have this process called back flush, which actually triggers the release of raw materials against the finished goods receipt. A lot of times the back flush is triggered at shipping. I would encourage you to trigger that back flush at finished goods receipt. And the, the, the other items is to get in the pick and ship. And then we could spend, as you probably figure all day, talking about this topic, uh, but it's basically consists of order picker, picking, customer labeling, order consolidation, packing, pick list. Customer labeling, we're getting the biggest demand around because our customers are being forced by their customers to do proper labeling, as well as to automate and as well as digitize their pick list. Here's an example of a customer who has an Excel spreadsheet that gets printed out and it gets distributed to the pickers as to what to pick. And you can see deliver today, deliver this ASAP. The problem with this list is that it may change from time to time. So now they're stuck with having to reprint this list and get a hold of people. By digitizing it, you not, can only push the changes in the orders quickly down to the handouts to the pickers. You also get into the more sophisticated types of picking called batch and weight picking, which we won't get into. Uh, license plate picking, which you may have heard about, which will certainly uh, support ASN type shipping as well as M um, SSCC type uh, labeling requirements, required license plates. Um, load verification, which I'm gonna show you a little quick uh, video on, as well as supporting on demand and printing all your your, your shipping documents. And again, there's a couple of screens that are available to uh, the folks in, in the picking area. Now I'll just run this quick video. And basically what it's, what's happening here is that we're doing a load validation with camera. Um, the, cam the, the customer purchased these cameras and we integrated this camera system into, their, into our WMS. So, but, so what they're doing here is as the person loads the pallets onto the trailer, the system is performing two transactions, a ship and a pick at the same time. So this saves the, the driver having to get off his truck and scan the pallet, also saves a lot of fines. They're shipping to Walmart, kitty litter in this case, and they're getting a lot of fines because the guys are getting the wrong information or shipping the pallet to the wrong doors. And the last thing I'll get to before I hand it over to uh, Mark is labeling. And as I mentioned earlier, we're getting all sorts of demands from many customers um, to support labeling of all these types of varieties, be it internal hold uh, labels to MH10, SSC18, John Deere, Polaris labels, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a lot of customers have to set up special labels uh, stations, such as the one you see here. There, there they are, they have their handy dandy Zebra printer printing off. And the key thing here is that it's easy to print a label, but it needs to be integrated to the workflow so the guys aren't interrupted. And the way to do that is to create on-demand labels and, and create detailed workflow diagrams, which um, we've gone through many such exercises. Um, ideally, you want to print any sort of labels that are not on the, the at, a, at I should say at the packing and shipping areas. You also want to relabel anything that is being returned back to stock. You want to label the scrap or the offcuts I talked about, and also you want to work with a third-party label design software that that supports the connection to your ERP and WMS.
Okay. So if you can, if you can manage to do the part one, do a part two, you will have the smart warehouse and then the foundation for future growth, whether it be adding AMRs, automatic uh, uh, autonomous, um, or I should say AGVs, or any sorts of um, devices or, or wearables that you want out there. But so, so that's it for me. And I'll uh, send it back to Will. Perfect. I believe we have Mark. Mark. Thank you, Will. And, and thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everybody, for spending some time with us today. Appreciate your time. Um, see if we can make this thing go. Yeah, Will, I am not getting the slide to advance here. So maybe you could do that for me. I appreciate that. Yeah, so I'm going to back up to 10,000 feet or so um, and um, comment on you know, what we see going on as a solution provider in the supply chain, what we're doing about it, where we're, where we're investing and uh, developing new capabilities and, and helping our customers operate uh, differently as, as we go forward. Um, a little bit of background. I, I have been uh, with, you know, Symbol Moto Zebra uh, for, for, for a while, really focusing on warehouse currently responsible for our strategy um, throughout the warehouse use case, which I think is Jeff uh, made clear, uh, and, you know, goes well into the manufacturing plant. And today more and more out actually into the retail store, we see the same, you know, workflows, use cases and, and requirements for solutions uh, going across the supply chain more and more. Um, as we go forward. And what we're seeing, I think, is a pretty dramatic um, rate of change, let's say, within supply chain practices. I think all of you, I'm sure, are familiar with uh, some of the pressures that are going on uh, that really spans, you think of it as mainly an e-commerce phenomenon, the idea that we have to operate with better speed, better operational visibility, which, which really requires uh, you know, very, very good accuracy as well. Uh, but it's not just retail. Uh, it's wholesale, it's 3PL, it's manufacturers. In fact, when you look at the uh, recent stats on warehouse investment in North America, what you see is most of the net growth is actually on the manufacturer side where they're uh, uh, you know, having to do more, more direct uh, or let's say just say more complex operations. So a lot of investment going on and a lot of change. And I did have the opportunity earlier in my career to work with a lot of companies uh, in a consulting and system integration capacity from supply chain strategy through facility design and go live. And uh, very often, you know, we usually about week 10 in that process, we'd have what I always thought was the most uh, important meeting of the entire, you know, what could be a two year project. And so we had done the interviews, we had done the data analysis, and now we're gonna sit down with the executive team of the client and help them understand Look, based on what you told us about your customer service objectives and your inventory policy and whatnot, this is what uh, the new and your growth rates, you know, this is what the new facility needs to look like and what kinds of, um, you know, investment that, that's going to require to support that. And then you get into a lot of give and take about, well, maybe we can adjust our inventory policy, maybe uh, our customer service requirements aren't quite that demanding and, and so forth. But the, the key is that we were asking the client to, to make design decisions, really firm commitments, because the decisions made at that meeting would drive with the, really the foundation of the design decisions that would flow from that over the next two years. And we were asking them to commit to that, uh, not only for until we got to go live, but for the useful or projected life of that facility three to five years out typically would be a, a design year. And you know, how many companies today have that level of certainty uh, that they can uh, commit to that? So what I see are two main factors driving um, our, our customers and as they think about their investment priorities and the technology uh, solutions that they're investing in. You know, one is speed. They've, almost everybody is looking to operate with greater speed uh, and all of that, and all of it, uh, that brings along. And the other is flexibility because the idea that, that you're going to commit to a CapEx uh, based on a business that's you know, changing fairly rapidly, and in many cases, having to buy capacity on day one that you, at least in theory, wouldn't need until the peak year, uh, just is, is a very uh, 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 tough, to, uh, tough to take. So we have uh, today, I think, uh, an emerging set of new technologies and new tools that can help our, our, our customers uh, and industry you know, meet these new challenges. I'm going to highlight some of those. Um, as we go through. So uh, next slide, please. So the first step is really to identify 
Um, go ahead and build that out if you would, a couple of clicks there. Uh, you know, what are the key metrics for your operation that you have to meet and, and focus on those? And are your current practices, operational practices, you know, the use of technology uh, like Jeff articulated, are they getting you where you need to be uh, in terms of you know, speed, um, efficiency, uh, visibility, and, and accuracy? Uh, whatever that may be. And so, you know, certainly we're hearing across the board from almost every customer we talk to real concerns about being able to attract and retain the labor necessary to operate their current operations as they are currently uh, designed. Um, talked about speed, uh, talked about accuracy and the need to respond uh, uh, to the market. So let's go to the next slide, if you would. <clears throat> So the other aspect of what's going on right now in supply chain, and certainly this is a big factor for Zebra, is there's a, a tremendous amount of innovation that's happening, just not just at the technology level, but uh, among our, our customers with their uh, uh, desire to leverage that technology and willingness to implement it. And that includes uh, you know, the warehouse management systems. It includes, of course, workers and workflow optimization, where traditionally that's where Zebra has focused. And, and, you know, we still, you know, that's our, the core of our business is enabling the employee, enabling the worker, largely with wearable technology and a lot of, um, um, you know, warehouse operations and workflows, but it also involves automation. And, and I've been working in and around automated systems uh, my entire career, including a fair amount of time in uh, uh, working in robotics earlier in my career. <clears throat> and the tools that we have now that, that uh, are, are just phenomenal. Um, in terms of not just automating a task, but automating it in such a way that you take out a lot of, of what would have been a very risky proposition. Um, the idea that uh, with traditional types of automation, you have, as I said, invest in the capacity that you need for the peak year and day one, difficult to scale up, difficult to scale down. Um, if your order profile changes, your SKU profile changes, your customer service um, definition changes. Can the automation adapt to that? In many cases, the answer has been no. I work with uh, a lot of customers today that you know they have uh, uh, an automated facility that uh, you know in the past would have been state of the art, very efficient. Uh, but the you know those fundamental assumptions about what is customer you know how do our customers define service um, and what does that mean for let's say order turnaround time? You know maybe the facility was designed for 24 hour order turnaround time, customers now expect two to three hour order turnaround time. Um, and you know, the mechanized systems just uh, aren't, aren't ready to, to adapt to that. So um, a lot of new tools, you know, Zebra of course has made some investments in that. We, we acquired Fetch Robotics uh, in the summer of last year, and we've been busy integrating Fetch. Those of you that may have attended a, a Modex show a couple of weeks ago in Atlanta, uh, you saw, you know, a lot of the new technology that uh, that we've uh, either you know incorporated into Zebra through acquisition or organically. In fact, uh, if you look at our booth, almost everything in there, you know, two years ago, which was the last time Modix occurred, uh, didn't exist. So uh, there's been a lot of change in terms of the tools that are available to be applied to to operational requirements. Um, next slide. And so one of the things that we've been looking at is you know. Uh, how do we come up with a, a single framework that not only incorporates, you know, our, the, the core tools, so the barcode scanners, the printers, the the um, uh, the fixed scanners, et cetera, that you know, ninety percent of us—that's what we use day in day out to run our warehouse and uh, and plant operations, as well as some of these newer technologies. And if you go ahead and build out this slide, appreciate it. Um, that are much more based on sensors and uh, of, of various types and the analytics that those sensors, uh, uh, based on the data those sensors provide. Um, go ahead and click forward a few times. So what you see in, uh, uh, in this model, one more time, as you look at phases one and two, it, based on this idea of worker-centric transactional data. And you know, I've been implementing warehouse management systems for a very long time. That, you know, the basic architecture of those have been very consistent over a long period of time. And in fact, the, the idea of what does real time mean, um, you know, in the in the WMS world, more often than not, when we talk about real time, what we're talking about is 
uh, what is my response time from the system when I scan something? Well, if it tells me to do something that takes five to 10 minutes to complete, which it very well might, uh, typically the system really has no actual visibility to what's happening during that five or 10 minutes. It's just waiting for that transaction to complete so it can give me the next one based on a, a predefined set of rules. And, and that has worked, uh, I think it has served the industry very well. Um, as we look at the phases here, we look at phase one and phase two within that kind of paradigm of how do I interact with, between the digital and the physical world. Um, you know, phase one being kind of basic, get control of every material movement. Um, and this is an appropriate place to be, let's say, for, for an operation that's uh, maybe, you know, handling all full pallets or, you know, basically a simple operation, you know. Um, and then phase two would be something that a larger, more complex operation. It's appropriate to, to live in that space. Um, so it might have you know, very you know, high order volume or rapid turnaround time or complex SKUs like medical or you know, wherever that complexity comes, that's generally what drives the need and the ROI for technology. And that's where you know, most of our, our customers would live in, in that world within that paradigm. But increasingly what we see is a move uh, over to the right, not for maybe the entire operation, but for perhaps for certain uh, challenges. And, and Jeff uh, identified an interesting one where you know, we're using a vision system to identify that materials have, have in fact uh, been moved where we expected them to move. I think that's a great example of going to uh, something that is uh, you know, sensor-based, uh, that's true real time, because we're sensing the physical world directly. We're not interpreting uh, an action that a, that a person took and interpreting that through some predefined rules, we, uh, we're sensing that uh, world directly. And so um, another acquisition that Zebra made really just a couple of weeks ago is uh, Matrox, you know, kind of building out our machine vision uh, capacity that we actually just started with some organic uh, uh, product announcements about 12 months ago. So that's developing very quickly. And passive RFID, a, a bunch of new products and tools on the passive RFID, RFID side. And what you see is, is it, it, the tool set just gets more and more comprehensive. So, you know, portals, dock door or conveyor, handheld options, you know, continuing to expand the, uh, the overhead reader, the wide area reader, the ATR 7000 that can not only read a tag over, you know, a very large area, but actually locate it within a couple, three feet, really opening up new ways of, of operating uh, different, uh, uh, you know, warehouse production, even retail types of operations. So we see not necessarily a replacement of the legacy world, but an augmentation of it through some of these new technologies. And that's really what the maturity model is, is about, is you know, creating that framework where we can have a conversation about all the technologies and what's the best way to apply them for your particular operation to help you meet, again, those key objectives that are important uh, to you. And um, you know, Jeff, Jeff talked a bit about manufacturing, discrete manufacturing, and, and I've spent a fair amount of time there. And I remember um, there was a major shift that happened in discrete manufacturing when work and process inventory went from being considered something good that, that was an asset that kind of protected you from the unpredictable uh, event to something that was bad. You know, it's a crutch. It's a crutch that kind of covered up for poor practices and, and poor quality. And so by, you know, and we use this analogy a lot, you know, we're gonna lower the, the volume of, of water in the river by lowering the amount of work and process inventory. And that's gonna expose rocks, you know, and those rocks might be just a poor practice or uh, a quality issue. And then we'll attack those rocks and we'll just get better and better. And that's, that's kind of lean manufacturing. And I think there's a similar sort of pressure being applied to a lot of supply chain operations, but and inventory is a part of it, but a bigger part of it is time. You know, it's the idea that we have to operate uh, more quickly. So we see that, you know, more and more emphasis on getting the yard integrated with warehouse operations, you know, getting the docks, you know, let's manage this a lot tighter. Let's get information about uh, in-transit inventory and make sure we're leveraging that. Uh, if our ASNs that are coming in at receiving are not accurate, you know, that's that's no longer tolerable. You know, we have to know that they're they're in fact accurate. We're going to pre-allocate against that. Those are just so, a few examples of how, you know, speed is impacting the way uh, our, our, uh, our customers want to operate. Uh, next slide. So as you look at the model, you know, we've kind of built this out in a fair amount of detail and, and, and we can get you access to, to some of this, but in each phase, there typically are different objectives that are operationally important and different technologies that are most appropriate to focus on. Um, 
you know, whether you're, you know, phase one, just kind of let's get basic uh, control over inventory movements, make sure, sure the system is, is confirming everything that moves. Uh, phase two, complex, uh, lots of folks. Let's make sure we're leveraging wearable technology uh, as well as we can, because we know there's going to be a good ROI from doing that and doing that well. Uh, so that could be voice, it could be uh, vision-based picking, uh, it could be you know wearable on the arm, wearable scanning, what have you, and you know continue to to innovate in that space. That's that's uh, critical, particularly you know in lots of lots of operations. And by pro by the way, probably the easiest one to see on a walkthrough when you see someone that's handling materials. And going through you know different gyrations to to integrate you know the the technology in with the, the physical workflow, uh, that's usually uh, you know low hanging fruit for for uh, using the right type of wearable technology. And then three is is the way that most operators get started with sensor based technology, and that's in a very limited targeted way. You know, I got, I've got a problem that I want to solve. Um, maybe it's, you know, for a lot of customers, it's customer order accuracy, they're, shit, they're making, you know, errors on the dock, errors in loading, what have you. Uh, for some, it's, it's on the other side, it's on the inbound. Um, you know, we got to make sure that we're, we're receiving, uh, you know, on a more timely base, basis or more accurately, but it really could be anywhere in the operation, it could be just inventory control um, and, and leveraging sensor technology to, uh, to drive to better performance there without adding labor is the key. And then uh, phase four, we look at that as kind of just expanding that same idea over a broad part of the operation. So I talked about the ATR, you know, you might, you know, if, if you could arrange in your particular situation to have all your inbound materials tagged with RFID, you know, you can light up the, the receiving dock with, with the ATRs and, and now you've got, you know, a comprehensive real-time visibility to everything that's on the dock. Uh, I think that's a logical place for for a lot of uh, operations to go, and then uh, beyond that, and we see some you know software folks really uh, already focused on this, is that if you assume that you had real time visibility to inventory and to material handling assets and to people, what kinds of control systems could you develop? Um, you know, if you really uh, had that kind of of uh, paradigm, and we see some that are moving in that direction, and we think that those. Those types of systems are actually going to be a lot more adaptable um, than than the legacy approach. Uh, next slide. Okay, so what are our customers telling us? Uh, I think a couple of clicks to build this out. <laughs> um, so 2019, 2024, what we saw was this uh, asked uh, the question: You know, what are the key things that you have to get right to get to for your operation to be effective today versus in the future? And um, you know, and we asked them in the current world, it was, you know what, we need, we need our, uh, we're very worker centric, we got to make our, sure our employees are as productive as they can be, and that they're connected to each other and to, to the management and the expectation is, as we go into the future, that we're actually going to have to be a lot more focused on asset uh, utilization, and operational visibility and real time data. And, and so that's what we hear from customers, that's what we hear from uh, the industry analyst community. And we just actually are uh, a few weeks away from publishing our, our next, our new warehouse vision study, where you'll see a lot of these same themes being uh, reinforced with uh, the current, uh, uh, you know, current perceptions. Uh, next slide. So what, you know, operations that are typically, um, you know, where, where uh, you know, there's typically a way, a, a, a propensity, let's say, to focus or to leverage uh, tools like this, one is certainly returns. And so I'm thinking here, probably RFID, but also vision can play a role here in returns. So part of the part of the e-commerce uh, experience is you typically see uh, a dramatic increase in returns as well as, as e-commerce goes up, uh, returns go up. We also have you know full product lifecycle management. So there's a you know as we strive to to be more green in our business practices, chances are we've got more product coming back, and we need to uh, disposition that. Um, and we also have customer expectations around returns. You know, we um, customers expect that our, that their returns will be handled uh, promptly and properly and accurately, and that they will get the credits and or the new product or whatever the disposition is. So uh, it's gone from you know the last thing you would see on a warehouse tour in the back corner to something that is increasingly. Uh, uh, critical to to business success, and so it's it's uh, driving investment. And um, um, so RFID to have visibility to um, really it's kind of unstructured. 
electric. You don't know what's coming in the door typically. Uh, you don't know what you're going to have to deal with. So you have to give um, uh, your people the best tools they can, whether it's at a, a you know, tri typically triage on a mobile basis and then detail processing at a, at a fixed workstation. Next slide. So another business process that is often uh, a candidate I think for RFID or other types of real-time location technology is cross-docking. Uh, and again, it's unstructured. Uh, typically, you know, you, you don't necessarily know exactly what's coming in the door. You've got to be able to identify it and disposition it in real time, uh, get it out to the loading dock. Um, and very often, the, you know, this is an opportunity for operational improvement, you know, to go from theory to, to practice on cross-docking can be quite demanding. So here we see an interest again in RFID, again in, in the ATR to be able to uh, direct and verify these moves without requiring a human to take an affirmative action to scan a pallet or to scan a location. We have a management system that has visibility to people, to material handling assets and to the materials themselves and is able to direct and confirm um, these material moves in a way that's just faster and more accurate, um, than, again, than the legacy approach. So that's the kind of things that we see happening right now in the supply chain. Um, we're really just in the early stages, I think, of, of, uh, of lots of innovation. On the robotic side, again, you can implement in a way that is very low risk. You know, you can <laughs> add a robot, take a robot away based on how the volume goes or if the business, uh, you know, the dynamics of the orders and SKUs. Uh, change. You know, you can uh, change the way you utilize this technology. So it's an exciting time, and um, we're excited to be a part of it. We look forward to partnering with with you and uh, and as you go forward. So with that, I think I'll uh, I'll hand it back to uh, Jeff and Will. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we have had a few questions come through here that I'd love to help address. I know Jeff, you've been helpful in uh, looking here as well. So. Um, I know one of the questions that most people asked was, are we going to receive a copy of this um, after the call to, uh, to be able to view this recording or access this information? Yeah. Yeah, Perfect. for sure. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Perfect. Um, Scott, I know you had uh, started to address a question here, but I think it was a good question. Um, the, the cost of inventory related to a lot of factors that may not be evident in the numbers if a client significantly increases their SKUs or diversification, that could uh, drive an increase in many inventory costs. Could you talk to that a little bit for the group? You want me to talk about that, uh, Will? Yes. Uh, so, sorry, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you raise a good point, Scott. And you know, it's ultimately what we're looking at is the ratio of your sales to your inventory. You want to try to um, not have your inventories grow faster than your sales, which sales does hopefully cover your costs. So the two should have a, a healthy margin in between. And so so as if your inventories are increasing faster than your sales. It's generally not a good sign, and it's, and it's it requires that you look at the efficiencies of your warehouse as well as your procurement pack practices and forecasts. So it's really a composite of a lot of things, but it's a good overall measure of how well you're managing your inventory in your warehouse in your warehouses. And it it goes to one particular KPI that I'm very fond of, which is inventory turns. Uh, you know, your CFO, your accounting guys are probably always, um, you know challenging the warehouse guys to increase returns and they go, you know, we're more interested in safety. We're more interested in, you know, shipments out the door. We're more, more interested in, in lines pick per hour. All relevant. Um, but ultimately, if you do all those things correct, your returns will start going up. And that's the whole magic of uh, creating these smart warehouses that if you're able to increase your returns, you're able to push out more inventory with the same amount of space and labor. And our customers are proof of that. Excellent. Yeah, if I could add just one thing, you know, I think one of the things, one of the areas where we're seeing a lot of innovation now is on um, on the demand analysis side, because, you know, once the inventory is there, um, it's relatively straightforward to say, you know, where do I want to fulfill from or, or statistically, how much should I have, you know, based on what I think about demand. But the question is, you know, are you thinking about demand properly because it's changing so fast? Uh, it's actually, a, you know, an acquisition, again, that Zebra made and, and add to it to help understand those demand signals and, and apply analytics to them to, to make sure that we're doing the best we can and, and getting the right amount of inventory in the right place. Excellent. Mark, I've got a question for you. Um, one that came up uh, earlier on here and uh, 
I, I, I tried to address it a little bit, but I think you'd be apt for this. So our AMR is replacing AGVs. <laughs> Well, it's an interesting question. So, you know, there, there is it is important to understand the, the difference. Um, one of the ways to understand the difference is as you look at videos of implementations, if, if the moving bot is walled off from people, that's probably an AGV. Uh, and if it's operating in and around people, it's probably, you know, it's a, definitely an AMR or probably anyway. So um, it really depends on, you know, how much do you value the operational flexibility that AMR gives you? And, or, or do you, are you automating workflows that require um, these, these bots to move in and around people? So if you're doing, you know, online, if you're doing, uh, you know, e-commerce fulfillment with a swarming bot type of approach, clearly that, that's got to be an AMR. Um, we, we do think that, you know, the manufacturing community, which has long used AGVs, uh, will see value in AMRs because of the, the inherent flexibility there. Uh, you don't have to, you know, have a static guidance technology like tape or something like that. You know, you can, you can easily redesign your layout, you know, and you can, re, you know, have the AMR autonomously uh, deal with obstacles and, um, and rerouting. So, uh, of course, it, they're generally a little bit more expensive than an AGV. So that's, that's what we think will be happening over time. Sure. Excellent. Uh, another question here uh, for you, Mark, um, that just came through. What kind of communication protocols are used between Zebra, uh, SmartPak Trailer, and MotionWorks? Can this talk to other ERPs, or could this be manufacturing? Uh, could could be, sorry, talk to other ERP, or could uh, manufact could be based manufacturing planning systems? Sorry, I'm reading that wrong. Yeah, so I think what you, you touch on is the integration challenge of, of all this technology. And there's a lot of folks looking to make it as easy as possible. I think specifically with SmartPak Trailer and, and MotionWorks, for example, you, you have an, a menu of different uh, communication technologies to choose from. Um, and you know, it's just a matter of you know, detailing those data fields and how they're going to be exchanged. I, I, you know, I, I don't think I want to go too much further. Sure. Um, and uh, maybe a question for both of you, is turn and earn by item still used? Turn and earn. Turn and earn. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. I'm not either, so okay. I'm go, maybe not. <laughs> All right. I know we had a couple questions about RFID, um, just generally getting some more information. So we'll certainly share that over. We've got a, a pretty mature model for that now working with Zebra. So we're excited to share that over with you that have asked about that. Um, let me just check to see if there was anything else that came through. All right. So that wraps up with those questions that we had posted here. If there's any other questions, please uh, post them. We can hang out here for a few moments and help answer those. And just confirmation, we will be emailing out the recording of this webinar following the call. Yeah, if I, if I may just share a, a couple of points is that, you know, the, as I say, Rome wasn't built in, in a day and the, whatever a lot of our clients are guilty of, and we're a little guilty ourselves, is that we get to the finish line of, of their implementation and everything's a breather or gets to put on another project. What they forget is that the, your warehouse is, needs, is evolving as the business is evolving. So you need to continuously improve on the warehouse and to do, uh, think of a little micro projects, you know, 60, 90 day projects where you're continually moving the needle. Um, so don't start your, don't stop your journey after you've got phase one done, say it's inbound and inventory counting or, or say it's, you know, shipping and labeling, right? Continue your journey. I know it's hard, but the whole idea is, is that, you know, the software, your, your WMS provider is continually improving the software. So it behooves you to take advantage of those improvements for the betterment of your business as well. Great point. Well, well, so we have a few more questions here as well. Um, so great question. Does Zebra provide RFID tags, printers, and scanners? Well, yes, they do. <laughs> and we support them with that. So um, that is actually something that we partner with Zebra to provide. 
uh, Zebra utilizes a channel to provide these goods and, um, and services and, and software capabilities. And so this is something that we support them with and certainly can provide you with any of the technology that we looked at here today. There's another question here. Um, uh, any continuing supply chain issues with products and hardware? Um, I, I'm sure Mark and I could talk for hours on this. Um, we are still seeing some constraints on certain products, certainly. Um, it, it's, it's dependent on which product, but there are still some constraints out there. We are working collectively with Zebra to do what we can to try to pull in products ahead of time. Um, you know, Jeff had a good point in his slides that, you know, we should be thinking about hardware more early in the process when we're evaluating any software or systems or changes. And so we would encourage you to still consider that. Um, but, uh, but we are still seeing some concerns on certain products. So um, the best way to handle this would be to evaluate what you may be looking at, work with us on that, and we can determine what sort of delays or options you may have with that. Uh, Mark, any other, I guess, finer points on that that you had from your perspective? I was going to say the same thing. I think, you know, um, you know, we used to, when I was you know, building out new, new WMSs, we had a, we had, we had a point in the project where it was like, okay, order, order the mobile hardware. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, ideally you can move that back earlier in the project that would uh, be good for all concerns. Yeah, absolutely. We find that hardware tends to be uh, coming towards the end of that process to Mark's point. And unfortunately, we don't want you to have to wait to go live based on the hardware. And so if we can get ahead of that at all, be thinking proactively. Um, a lot of times we can pinpoint down the hardware you're probably wanting to look at uh, based upon the type of software, the type of move you're looking to make. So um, uh, okay, another question. I know you provide evaluation loaner uh, models. How can I get a demo or does sales take care of it? Um, we can certainly provide a demo of any of the systems um, from uh, Portable Intelligence, from Zebra, from barcodes here. So what I would encourage everybody to do here, um, I will follow up on this specifically for this exact question, but if anybody does have any specific needs, um, We'll make sure when we follow up with an email and send out the link to provide contact information to how you can request this. And then any of us will work together collaboratively to help get you the demos or information you need. Uh, great question that just came up. Uh, is it possible to discuss the individual case need and develop it remotely to East Africa? Um, I believe Zebra, we have support for that, uh, for the hardware component in, in that region. I believe so, but I can't say definitively. Uh, this would be another great one. If you follow up with us, we'll make sure to route to the right channels to get you the right contacts for that. And, and Jeff, uh, to, to your software point, um, is that something that you guys support globally? Yes, absolutely. And, um, and also, yeah, we, it also, it always comes down to the use case and, and figuring out if there's a um, ROI in it and, and value. Yeah, so certainly, okay. and it all depends on, you know, what language is required in East Africa as well. Excellent. Okay, wonderful. So yeah, please follow up with us with any questions on that and we'll make sure to direct you to the right people. Uh, could this be potentially integrated into any system that already has a current barcode system in place? I'm going to assume uh, we'll answer that from two points real quick here. From a software perspective, uh, for Jeff, um, uh, is if they have some system in place already, is that something you can still come in on board to help with? Yes, and often we're asked to augment. You know, what's what Smart does is it will take uh, several of your data points, be it a purchase order, work order, or or sales order, and optimize that workflow around it or just be able to print a better label. So there's a number of things that we could do to basically coexist with your existing um, barcoding so, uh, solution. Wonderful, and, and I can help answer from the Zebra and barcodes perspective, certainly any of the systems further along that maturity um, model that uh, Mark had talked to, uh, absolutely those can fit in and work alongside of or replace certain barcoding systems depending on um, what that need may be. Again, uh, we'd love to have you reach out to us and we can evaluate the best approach to that. Perfect. Great questions here at the end. I appreciate you submitting those. Um, I think we're right at the hour here. So thank you all again. We appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Mark and Jeff, great presentations. Thank you so much for joining us here. Um, everybody, please look for an email. 
uh, there will be an announcement for the winners of Jeff's book, and then uh, we will get to 